everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Mel, I'm an Uruguayan neuroscientist and on the side of my PhD I have this YouTube channel in which I interview scientists from all over the world. And today's guest, she is from Brazil and she works in systems neuroscience. Her name is Georgia Bastos and a while ago I made a video with a professor from the United States in Columbia University called Alexander Harris. He also works in systems neuroscience, but he is also interested in the clinical perspective, the clinical applications, and he talked about depression and certain uh, re related circuits to that. But Georgia here, she also works in systems neuroscience, but in other aspects. So this is really cool to have a, yet another perspective on these topics. She's going to talk about her studies on how different brain areas connect and work together. And she mentions visual cortex, so visual systems, visual perception as an example. So hi, Georgia. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you so much for giving your time for this. Hi Mel, it's really good to be here. So to start, tell us a bit about yourself. The funny thing is that I really never imagined that I was going to get a career in science. When I was in Brazil, I would probably have gone to law school if I were in Brazil. I was very interested in, in, in law, but I really wanted to get out of the country to study. And whenever I came to the United States, I had to choose um, a major and I couldn't do law. So I had to do another thing and then I kind of had to ask myself what did I really like then and I always always loved my biology classes in school and I was always fascinated but a little bit bothered about biology because I think that um, it's very fascinating how it all works but it bothers me that we don't know enough so whenever I had to choose again for a major I went and choose biotechnology which was a way to use biology for other things um, and that was my kind of little breakthrough into science and nowadays I cannot imagine myself doing anything else. So I really love neuroscience, I think it wasn't my major but it grew to be really my passion it was um, through my minor that I realized that I really like understanding neuroscience and neuroscience is a very rich field, there's a lot of ways you can probe the brain. But I would say that kind of like the research that I'm doing right now is my favorite part of the field. Um, and what I do, our research is based on this idea of the brain, um, it's called systems neuroscience. So rather than studying one region specifically or one cell specifically, we're studying how all of this connects together. Um, so sort of like we look at the brain as a system. And I really like that because I was, as I said, I was bothered about biology because it was little things happening and I could never see the big picture of it. But I think that <clears throat> systems neuroscience really gave me that insight because you're not, you know, you're not reducing the brain, which is the most complex thing in the world, to one cell that can do one thing or to one region that does one thing specifically. No, you're looking at everything. And I really like also the fact that uh, when you think of a system, when you think of the brain, you're not thinking about something that is isolated and it's static or it just acts when something comes and, and like pushes it. The brain is constantly active. So there is like a temporal relationship to the way that <clears throat> the brain processes things. And this temporal relationship kind of goes into the realm of systems neuroscience that we study because we don't only study how one thing connects to the other, but how one thing connects to the other in a specific time frame in relation to uh, the stimulus or the environment that you're, you're in. Super cool! And within that, what do you do? I study um, the connections between your frontal area of the brain with your sensory area, specifically the visual sensory area, which is usually here in the back of the head. And the idea is that every time you're looking at something, right, you have this incoming information from the environment. You know, like your eyes right now, like I'm looking at everything around me and the, the light information is coming to my eyes and it's being translated from like the, the cells in my retina to some visual information, right? But nothing that you are seeing can be understood without some context, right? Like if you, you know, I cannot see one um, thing, again, like isolated in time. That's not how we see things. We see things under a context under um, some other features of the environment that are happening. 
in a lot of contexts, what context can be is also your expectation expectations towards something, right? So if you see something over and over and over and over again, there is a part of the brain, and in this case, it's the frontal part, that is making what we call like an internal model of the environment that is kind of getting this information that you're seeing this one thing over and over and over and over again. And in that way, it can kind of predict what's going to come next. So um, if, if I see, you know, a bunch of straight lines over and over and over and over again, I'm going to assume that the next thing that I'm going to see is going to be straight lines. But if, so that creates kind of like a prediction, right? So the frontal areas of your brain are able to predict sensory information based on previous sensory information. But then if I'm seeing those straight lines and then um, out of nowhere, those straight lines just start. And that was like horizontal lines. Whenever I'm looking at this, the reaction, the, the, the sort of what, what your brain is going to do is going to be like, whoa, this is not what I was expecting. And the moment that you are not seeing what your brain has predicted, you are processing that information again and you have actually a increase in activation um, of your sensory cells whenever you see this stimuli that is different. So the idea of my project is that we're studying the circuit of the frontal areas of the brain and how the frontal areas of the brain create this internal model, this predictive model of what, about what's going to be the context or uh, not maybe that, just um, of what the environment is. And this information is send to your sensory areas. So whenever you're <clears throat> getting this information from the environment, this raw kind of raw sensory information, that information is modulated by your internal model that is informing how predictive this stimulus is in the context of that. One of the things that I find cool about this research is uh, that one of the measurements that we use to kind of assess how uh, this brain regions are communicating with each other is through uh, what we call brain oscillations. And it's, it's a very uh, complex kind of idea, but it's known for a long time now that your brain um, kind of produces these oscillations when it's working. So if you kind of record electrical activity from your brain, <clears throat> you can see that they fall into this frequency bands. So an oscillation, I would say, is sort of like like bursts of activity that happen in some sort of defined frequency, right? So you can think of like music as an oscillation because it's like sounds that have different frequencies. Um, you can think of me throwing a rock in a, in a pond and the waves it creates, those are also sort of an oscillation. And the brain kind of works like that as well. And one of the things that we've been finding out and it's, it's kind of like the basis of the work that we do is that um, oscillations are ways for different regions of the brain to connect with each other, to sort of exchange information between each other. So what we see is that um, brain regions, they are far from each other, they're going to be activated. So the cells there, they're going to activate and they're going to sort of release this electrical potential. And the, the, the frequency by which they are, are activating, it's going to generate a frequency. And then that frequency, kind of travels around the brain and is able to affect local processing. So that's some sort of one of the ways that we are looking at this connection between frontal brain and sensory brain, is that we're trying to look at what frequency of activation do they synchronize in. Um, and that has, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot that we can do with that and it's just uh, a different way of understanding brain systems because I think that we are used to kind of like looking at things the way that we can look at them, right? Like, so you dissect the brain and you see the brain and you see its connections, you see the thousands of cells, and you see how everything connects. But if like a, a brain that is dead, that is static, that is in isolation is different from a brain that is inside my head and in your head and in everyone's head that is active and it's working. And what this recent project and this work that I'm doing in my PhD is really showing me is how the brain works and I think that this concept of oscillations is really interesting to think of. The way that your brain can have multiples of 
multiple multiple different oscillations happening at the same time, and those are informing different parts of the brain and exchanging this information and binding information together, because um, you need this sort of richness of connections and, and, and ways by which information can be differentiated in the brain for you to be able to compute other information that is around the world, right? So I think that a really cool thing that I've been finding out about neuroscience is the study of oscillations and how it can really have um, a impact on perception and behavior and all of that. Yes, super fascinating. And this also can be applied to diseases, right? I mean, you, you study it in a more basic research oriented manner, as I understand, but because in a lot of these disorders of the brain, it comes back to a problem of sensory processing, the perception and all these, these processes that happen there, they are being deregulated or there, there's some issue happening there. And the idea is that uh, people, especially um, psychological diseases such as schizophrenia, which is the main um, kind of like disease that we're looking at in our lab, um, the idea is that whenever the brain fails to have this, you know, connection between the frontal brain and the sensory areas to establish context, you are you have a brain that first it's unable to kind of match this predictions, right? Like this, that the, the brain is making predictions about the environment. The predictions that the, the, the person with schizophrenia has in the brain, in, in some sense, would not match with reality. And that would be because um, some parts of this network that we call, right, the network, the, the circuit between the frontal and sensory areas is disrupted. So I think that there is um, a lot of importance to this, especially because I don't think that the ways that we understand the brain are really helpful um, into actually treating psychological diseases. I think that people with schizophrenia nowadays have uh, some selection of pills that they can take, but they have severe side effects. A lot of people don't take them. They're very um, against taking those pills because it makes them feel not good and, and the side effects are, are not good. And um, it's just because I don't think that those um, the, those pills, that the medicine, it's not precise enough because it's basically mostly based on the dopamine theory of schizophrenia that it's looking at one neurotransmitter type um, or like one type of cell and trying to translate that into medicine and um, it, it might help in one way but it's going to be you know unbalancing other systems of the brain so I think that by studying the brain in a different way we can find different alternatives especially alternatives that are more holistic in the way that you treat the disease that you're not looking at like a magic pill, like a magic bullet that's going to make it everything okay. You have to understand how the systems are working together. And dopamine is probably, and it's obviously a part of it, but it's not the whole story. So we need to kind of build up from this, you know, bits of information. But I think that it's, um, it's of extreme importance for us to understand this in a different way because people are suffering around the world and they're, and they're taking pills that are not helping them and they're being ostracized from society and they're being misunderstood also because um, uh, we, don't, we don't take time to understand people with schizophrenia. So I think that being in this field and, and being a person like me, I, I want to understand the brain because I'm very curious about it and also because it bothers me the way that we are not able to help people and help the world in that sense because we just don't know enough. Yes, definitely. On its own is very important, but also the clinical application I think is really cool as well. And since I have a scientist from Brazil in another country doing her science work, doing her scientific studies, do you have any piece of advice that you would like to give to some student watching, maybe someone from Brazil as well that is considering a career in science or thinking about going abroad? You're capable, you're smart, and you can do a lot in this world, even, even if you feel like your circumstances are not putting you in that place. I think we have to go, we have to find what really drives us in the world, what really, like, it's that thing that cannot leave your head, the thing that you really want to know more about it. 
And once you find that, you have to go after it and you have to expose yourself to it. And uh, the same way that I was doing biotechnology in school and I wasn't really 100% into biotechnology and it just kind of like it, it brought some fire to me. It's just like, I want to know what I like. And then I start taking a bunch of different classes in school and then neuroscience kind of pop up in my head. I'm like, that's it. And nowadays I never, never regret that, that choice because I really know that's something that drives me. Because I think that everyone is capable of doing the work that I do and the work that all scientists do. I think everyone is capable of that. It's, it's not hard and it's not for only the geniuses in the world. No, it's for hardworking people as same as a lot of jobs. I think the thing that differs is that you have to have some resilience. And the thing that I find myself, you know, the thing that I find in myself to really keep holding on when I feel like I don't have energy and I'm stressed out is that I really like this. I, I'm really, I'm really interested in, and my passion for these topics is what keeps me there because I'm thinking, you know, I don't know how to do any of these things. And whenever I, I got into science, I didn't know any of these things, as I, see, I was all saying, when I was back home in Brazil, no science education, and it was, <laughs> I was thinking of going to law school, so like, completely different world. But the thing that really has kept me believing that I could do this is because I am very interested in this, and I really love uh, thinking about this. So I think that that's, my advice is to, for, for you to really go after the things that you think um, are going to make you happy. And besides, I know that there's different circumstances to everyone in the world, uh, but I feel like a lot of times we are kind of trapped in what we think we need to do or what society expects us to do. And that's not really true. I think that you make your own path and you can f make your own opportunities. And that's another thing. I think that uh, there's different paths to success and it doesn't need to be you getting into the best school and you getting the best grades and you having a 4.0 and a triple major. If you have that, amazing, but it doesn't need to be like that. Like there's this sort of competition of who achieves more. And I don't think that that at the end is going to lead to success. I think success, people, successful people are very happy being busy <laughs> with the stuff that they like doing. So one thing that I advocate for a lot is to increase the diversity in science. And not just because we need to increase diversity everywhere in the world, you know, but because I think science is such an important part of society because it established some truths that we follow, right? And for millennia, this truth has been built by the same type of person, right? Like you think about this white man, the beard, Einstein style. And Although, you know, we wouldn't be here without that scientific knowledge, I don't think that that's the only perspective that we should have. I think that different people bring different perspectives to science, and that's of extreme importance for us to have a whole conversation about all these phenomena, especially when we're talking about neuroscience in the brain, right? Like, there's so many ways that you can ask different questions that are going to bring up the result that you would never imagine. So we need these new perspectives. We need to build scientific truths. They are built from a consensus from all types of people, not just the people that have the privilege to be here today. So, and I think we need to do a better job at helping people realize that and sort of um, helping people grow the confidence that you need to have to be a scientist because you do need to be confident on your own ideas, on your own self-worth and your ability to do things. And I think that that's the biggest problem of helping um, diversity in science because we are kind of taking these measures, they're open up spots and opportunities, but we're not helping people to actually build the base of being a good scientist. So then what we have is like, we have more, you know, let's say girls in school when we have a bunch of scholarships for people of color. But then at the end, if you're gonna open a textbook and if you're gonna find out about the newest scientific discovery, it's usually the white man. And I have nothing against the person itself, but I think that the, it's just the more privilege that you have, the more confident that you become. And the system nowadays values the, the highly confident person that is able to go and sort of pretend like I know something um, and just, you know, present myself out because I'm confident.
that's the person that um, the system values nowadays. While there is shy people and then there is introverted people and there's people that, you know, maybe don't speak English that well or, you know, don't know the logistics of the system that well, don't know even what a PhD is. But there is so much intelligence that is hidden behind these walls of confidence and walls of exposure that I think we need to really, really work to help people believe in themselves more. So then those ideas, they're inside of the heads of people that if they are not given the opportunity and they're not helped to see that those ideas are worth something, they will never say that and they will die with these ideas that could be mind blowing and it could change the whole world. Everyone should be able to do science if they really want to. And we should encourage people, all sorts of people, to believe that they're smart enough, that they're intelligent and that they can succeed in this career. Yes, definitely. I feel like a lot of people, they block themselves internally because of all these misconceptions. Um, and also, I mean, this happens all over the world, but in Latin America specifically, there's this conception of how a scientist looks like or how acts like or certain characteristics and I feel like a lot of people compare themselves to that and say okay that's not me I'm not gonna go into science because the representation sometimes is lacking. This was a big motivation for me to start this YouTube channel and to be having these kind of conversations with people like you so that other people that they were in my shoes or your shoes at that time that they can access this information a bit faster and know how the science world looks like and how it functions and if it's something for them or not. And also to connect with scientists, right? Because now, for example, they know you, they know me, someone can contact us and ask for some questions or get some help. And those were all the questions that I have for you for today. So thank you so much, Georgia, for being here with us. I really appreciate it. Good luck in all your endeavors and see you in the next time. Thank you. It was so nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you so much, Mel, for doing this and sorry, giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit more and do this big work of science communication. And thank you for your attention. If you liked the video, I invite you to subscribe to the channel, to give a thumbs up, to leave a supporting comment. I also have a Patreon account and with every contribution, I can work with freelancers in Latin America to keep producing videos, make more content nicer and see you in the next one. Bye bye.